Hey everyone and welcome to the channel. Today I'm showcasing and explaining the newest version of my wildly popular script, Cryo Utilities. Stay tuned for easier tweaks, more performance boosts, and even some ways to save a lot of storage on your deck. Alright, let's get right down to it. Today, the newest update to Cryo Utilities is live, rounding out to a version 2.0. I've completely gutted the old version and rebuilt it from the ground up in Go using the Fine GUI framework. The code is in the same repo as before, link in the description below. I'm sorry in advance to any Go developers for what I've done to your poor, poor language. I come from old school languages and I'm still getting a hang of it. Plus, I kept adding new features, so the code can definitely be consolidated and optimized. I'm more than open to any feedback or PRs on the repo, so please do so if you have the experience. Last thing before we get started. This video took me well over 100 hours of testing, development, benchmarking, and writing, and will likely be another 10 to 15 hours before it's recorded and edited in full. If you appreciate the work that goes into these massive videos, please consider hitting the subscribe button. Every one of my videos has this attention to detail and tons of technical analysis, and I'd appreciate it much more than you'd know. Alright, let's start with what performance you can expect by using these fixes. Red Dead Redemption 2 gained 5% and 8% average FPS on low and high respectively. It also became much smoother. Rise of the Tomb Raider had similar averages, but became much smoother, resulting in even high playing completely above 30 FPS. Grand Theft Auto V gained a massive 43% on low and 18% on high, as well as smoothing out. And Horizon Zero Dawn has had the unfixable stutter it gets at all times almost completely mitigated. Now that you know what you can expect, let's get into how to install or update to the latest version. First, if you haven't set a sudo password yet, it's really easy. Open a terminal and use the command passwd on screen now. It'll ask you to enter a password. Type in the password that you want. It won't show anything, but don't worry, it is typing in the background. After entering it, press the enter or return key, type the same password again as a confirmation, and then press enter or return one last time. And that's it, you have a sudo password. Installation is very simple. First, go to the repo github.com slash cryobyte33 slash steam dash deck dash utilities. The link is on screen and in the description below. Next, scroll down to the install section, right click the link, then press save link as. Navigate to the desktop folder and save it there. If, for some reason, you don't get a pop-up after pressing save link, go to game mode and then back to desktop mode, then try to download it again. Now, on the desktop, double-click the file and press continue to mark the file as trusted. It'll automatically start the install. If you have a previous version or even the old Steam Deck Swap Resizer script, this will remove that and install the new version. When the install is done, you'll get a notification that it completed and you can delete the installer file off of your desktop. If you're on a previous version of the script, just run the Update Cryo Utilities icon on the desktop. No matter which version you have, it should update to the newest version. Same as the install, you'll get a notification when it's done. After the script is installed, you'll have three new icons on your desktop, and three new entries in the KDE menu under Utilities. The actual launcher script, the program, and supporting files can be found in slash home slash deck slash dot cryo underscore utilities on screen now. Before getting to the graphical version, I do want to mention that you can run the script and access almost all functionality with the CLI. Simply run sudo dot cryo underscore utilities slash cryo underscore utilities space help shown on screen and in the description below to see what you can do. I feel like most people who prefer terminal mode will know how to handle it from here, but keep in mind that you need to run it with sudo. To run in the standard graphical mode, just use the desktop or menu icon labeled Cryo Utilities. It'll start right away. After booting, you'll immediately be met with a disclaimer. This is the part where I tell you that I'm not responsible for anything that might happen to your device while running this. That said, nothing Cryo Utilities does should cause any harm to come to your device, but it must be said. 
If you agree to the terms, then press yes. Next, you'll be presented with a text entry to enter your DEC or pseudo password. Enter the password and press submit. If the password is correct, then you'll be brought to the home page. If not, retry. The home page is pretty simple, with a greeting and two large buttons. If you don't care about what any of the tweaks do, or if you watch the video and want to apply them all, the recommended button will set everything to the values that I recommend. Please keep in mind that if you haven't run a trim in a while, this can take a bit, up to 30 minutes. Just leave it and it should complete within that time, or follow my instructions to run a trim later in the video. If you ever want to revert everything back to the stock values that ship with the Steam Deck, then just press the stock button. Everything will be reverted to just like it was new from the factory. That's it for the home page, let's move on to the swap tab. The first thing you'll notice here is the bar at the top. The values are color coded. Red means that the setting is something that's not optimal. Green means optimal, and gray means that for some reason the value could not be determined. Everything on this tab is the same as the previous version of Cryo Utilities, but I think that I can explain things better and with much higher quality than I did previously. If you watched my last video on Cryo Utilities, you should be able to skip this section, but I recommend watching it anyway if you want to follow the later sections since I extend the analogy used here. Let's start out with an explanation of swap. To understand what swap is, first you have to understand a little bit about memory. In a computer, there is short and long-term memory. The long-term memory is stored on either hard drives or a drive utilizing flash storage like SSDs. In the 64GB DEC, we have an eMMC, or Embedded Multimedia Card. Think of it like a really big microSD. The 256GB and 512GB versions of the DEC come with an SSD or solid state drive. Regardless of type, these are used to store lots of data in the long term, but are slow comparatively to short term memory. The types of data stored on this are basically endless. Anything that needs to be stored on a computer for any length of time will be saved to the long-term memory at some point. The short-term memory of a computer is stored in various stages of random access memory, or RAM. RAM is super fast, but has low capacity and loses its contents when it doesn't get power, which is why we need long-term memory. The use case for RAM is to have some data on hand so the CPU can access it very quickly. Without RAM, everything would need to be fetched from long-term storage every time, and the computer would be abysmally slow. Normally, if RAM filled up and you needed more space to store what you're working on, the computer would need to evict something from RAM and then load the new data in. This is fine here and there, but in some situations this process can cause issues. Things that rely on incredibly fast redistribution of memory, like gaming. Because we need to have a certain level of maintained performance over a long period of time, any hiccups in memory management can cause bad frame timing, lower frame rates, or even crashes in the worst cases. So, now that we understand what RAM is, let's go over what a swap file is and why it can help. A swap file, or page file as it's called on Windows, is basically an expansion of your short-term memory but stored in long-term memory. This means that it's a lot slower than the RAM, but provides a buffer for seldom used data that still needs to be at hand. Let's give an example to visualize the memory handling on a computer. In this example, let's assume that you're an accountant. Your job is to keep track of numbers, including historical data. You're in your office when a coworker comes in and asks you about some historical financial data. Using this example, we'll have several stages of memory. The first would be the numbers that you already hold in your brain. It's very fast to remember something, but you can only remember a few things before losing track. Unfortunately, you can't remember all the information you need to tell the other person, so you decide that you need to hold a piece of paper with some numbers on it. The numbers on the paper are easily accessible, but you have to look down and read the paper to fetch them. The paper can store more info than your brain can, but the space on that one paper is very limited, so you decide that you need a filing cabinet. The filing cabinet can store a ton of data, and it's all sorted really well, but every time you need to find a certain number, you have to look up where it is, go to the filing cabinet, deposit your old paper, pull out the correct paper, go back to your desk, and then read it. You decide that it's way too slow to grab the new page you need from the filing cabinet, so you dedicate a drawer in your desk to holding some papers. 
Getting into the drawer still takes a moment, but it saves you the time to go to the filing cabinet and find what you need, since you know exactly what's in the drawer. It can also hold a decent amount of papers before needing to move any back to the filing cabinet, so it's a lot faster to get the data that you need. So after all of this, we have the following. Your brain is the CPU's cache. It's super fast and always available, but has a very limited capacity. The paper in your hand is the RAM. It's fast and always available, it has a better capacity than your brain, but it's still very limited. The filing cabinet is the HDD or SSD. It's super slow but can store tons of data. The drawer is swap. It's close at hand but slower than holding a paper already. It has decent storage but not nearly as much as a filing cabinet. Hopefully the example helps visualize each stage of a computer's memory and will give you some background to what I'm going to say next. Swap can take a few different forms. In Windows, it's called a page file. In Linux, you can use either a partition or a file. Swap, unlike RAM, can be resized easily. Once RAM is installed, that's the total amount that you have. With a swap file, you can choose how much of a drive to provide a swap at any time, which is great news for us. By default, the Steam Deck has a 1GB swap file stored on the internal drive. In our previous example, this would be like having a tiny drawer that was only big enough for index cards. We can resize the swap, or drawer in the example, to be whatever size we need, and that's exactly what the swap resize function of Cryo Utilities does. First, let me give you some disclaimers about this process. This process only works in Linux, so Windows on the deck cannot use this. Overutilizing swap technically does wear your SSD out quicker since it has a limited lifespan. That said, this is not concerning for a reason I'll mention when going over the next tweak. The process, and all processes in this video, are completely reversible at any time. The swap file needs to be on the internal SSD. It cannot be installed to a microSD, nor would you want it to be since it would limit both performance and microSD longevity. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's get into the tutorial. Changing the swap file size is incredibly easy. You simply need to press resize and select the size that you want. As for which size I recommend, here's a chart for performance differences. Keep in mind that the swap resize isn't at its full potential on its own, but we'll get to that in a bit. Anything above 16 gigabytes doesn't benefit performance in any game I've tested, but it could help with the suspend game plugin on Deki. 16 gigabytes has the best size to performance ratio and my recommendation if you have the space. 4 gigabytes is the bare minimum that I'd recommend and only if you don't have space for the other higher values. Cryo Utilities will only show you swap sizes that you have enough space for, plus an additional gigabyte. The extra gigabyte is to prevent you from running out of space during the resize, as to avoid the SteamOS bug that causes boot loops with full drives. This is also how the recommended setting is calculated, with it picking the largest setting that you have space for up to 16 gigabytes. After you've selected the size, press OK and it'll start the resizing process. The entire process can take up to 30 minutes. Just as a note, if for some reason this step fails, chances are that your drive needs to be trimmed. To trim your drive, go to Game Mode, then to Settings, System, scroll all the way to the bottom, and then press Run Storage Device Maintenance Tasks. Wait for it to complete. If you haven't done it in a while, or at all, it might take a bit. Afterwards, go back and try to resize the swap file again and it'll be much faster. Now that we're done with the swap file, let's move on to the other setting on this page, Swappiness. Swappiness can be explained by extending the previous analogy. Let's say that your office is as we left it the last time. You're happily giving out numbers as people ask for them, but you find that sometimes you end up putting a paper back in the drawer just to need to take it out again a second later. You decide that to prevent this, you'll start holding onto papers for a little bit longer before putting them back in the drawer. The act of holding onto papers for a little longer before putting them away is very similar to the swappiness setting. Basically, swappiness is a numerical value from 1 to 200 that determines whether the kernel prefers to put data into swap or hold it in memory. The lower the swappiness, the more the kernel prefers memory, and the higher the swappiness, the more the kernel puts items into swap. As a quick note, my previous video mentioned that swappiness was on a scale of 1 to 100, which used to be the case. 
It has since been updated to a scale of 1 to 200, but my previous recommendations are still valid. The Steam Deck's default is a value of 100, which means that a large amount of all memory will be stashed into swap, even if there's a lot of space left in the RAM. The Deck's default is very high, even by standard Linux settings, with most distributions using a value between 40 and 60. By lowering the swappiness value, we can really easily keep more data in memory, which reduces the amount of time needed for most memory operations and can translate to fewer latency spikes when playing games. As an added benefit, it will save a lot of life on your SSD, or eMMC, since it avoids writing data to the drive unnecessarily. This is what I was referring to in the swap section when I said that you shouldn't worry about the additional writes. The next button in the Cryo Utilities UI will let you choose which value to use. I recommend a value of 1, as that's where I've personally noticed the greatest performance benefit and it saves the most SSD life. Any value of 25 or lower should be relatively similar if you don't want to use such an extreme value. With swappiness done, let's move on to the next tab, Memory. The top of the Memory tab is similar to the Swap tab, with color-coded statuses. There are five new tweaks on this page, four of which have never been mentioned on this channel. They work best together, so let's see a graph of what they can do for performance compared to Cryo Utilities 1.0. Now that you see how much they can help, let's start at the top with Huge Pages, also known as Transparent Huge Pages. Huge Pages work really well with our previous analogy as well. Let's say that you're in the same office, and sometimes you have to copy data from your papers to new papers that you give to your coworker. Every time you start a new page, you need to fill out the header and footer, including your name, the date, and the page number. That's not a lot for one page, but you have to do it for every single one. You have the idea to start putting all the papers in a folder, which you can label with your name and the date. Now you only need to write the page number on each paper, and it saves a lot of time. This is exactly how Huge Pages works. Instead of being limited to only 4 kilobytes of space per page, which is what a group of areas in memory is called, the kernel can use up to an entire gigabyte per page. This reduces the overhead of assigning new memory to a program, which allows data to load in from the drive much faster and usually results in fewer frame rate drops when loading in new assets or reading back from the swap file. The button in Cryo Utilities is super simple, you just press it once to toggle it on. It persists until you disable it again, so no need to have the System Toolbox plugin installed or set it each time you reboot. Next up, we have Shared Memory in Transparent Huge Pages. Shared memory and transparent huge pages doesn't really need an analogy the same as the previous tweaks, as it's very simple to explain. In the Linux kernel, there are a bunch of things that end up in memory that are shared between processes, which normally don't end up in huge pages, even if it's more efficient. The enable shared memory and THP button tells the kernel to allow huge pages for shared memory if it's more efficient to do so, and can speed up some memory operations. Next, let's move on to compaction proactiveness. If you're a bit older, or rapidly aging like me, then you'll probably remember the days when we had to defragment hard drives. It was done to move data into a sequential order to make it faster to access. Well, compaction is exactly the same process but for memory, and Cryo Utilities can disable it. You might be asking, why would we disable it if it's meant to speed up access? That's because rearranging memory in the middle of a memory-intensive process, like a game, can cause big latency spikes. Some of the times you get frame rate hitching or a big lag spike can be attributed to this process, especially in CPU-bound games. As the previous tweaks, just press the button to disable it. Let's look into the next, very related, setting, Huge Page Defragmentation. Just like compaction does for normal memory, huge page defragmentation does for huge pages. Essentially, disabling this will prevent lag spikes that happen when defragmenting huge pages. Simple as that. This is another one of those, just press the button and it'll be toggled settings. Okay, let's move on to the last tweak in the memory section, page lock unfairness. To explain page lock unfairness, let's go back to the analogy one last time. This will likely be a little long-winded, but it'll make sense at the end. Let's say that you have a very important paper filled with this quarter's financial results. You need to make sure that everyone important sees it, but don't want to make copies because it's sensitive information. 
you decide that you'll keep the paper on your desk and then email everyone who needs to see it, telling them that they can come down and borrow the paper to review. When they're done, they have to bring the paper back down and leave it in the same spot on your desk, at which point you'll email everyone else that needs to see it. So let's assume that you email five people that the paper is available. Your coworker John borrows the page and then returns it. Now you email the remaining four people on the list, and Liz comes down, borrows the paper, and then returns it. John contacts you and tells you that he needs to see it again, so you add him back to the email list. Then, you email everyone telling them to come get the paper. John shows up first and takes it again, which frustrates Susan, who shows up just a few minutes later. Then, John returns the paper. Now, you email the remaining three people on the list. Robert comes and picks up the paper and then returns it a few minutes later. Then, John emails you and says that his intern messed up and he needs to see the paper again. You add him back to the list and email everyone on it. Of course, John shows up first and takes the paper. Susan is furious at this point as she hasn't been able to see it at all, and John has gotten to see it three times. This is basically how page lock unfairness works. In SteamOS, the kernel will let a single process claim a page of memory up to five times before forcing it to go to a different process. The button in cryoutilities will set this value much lower, to one. That means that the kernel won't stall out while trying to figure out where a page goes next, but it'll also allow handing the page back to the prior process once. In effect, this reduces a lot of stutter that can happen while processes wake up and sleep during the normal course of a game, and it smooths the frame rate out. Hopefully all of you are still with me, because I think the storage tab is something that's going to help a lot of people, especially 64GB deck users. The first option, Sync Game Data, will move the shader caches and compat data, or prefixes, of each game to the same drive that it's installed on. Then, it'll create a symbolic link back to the SSD so Steam thinks that it's in the same location. Essentially, it'll keep all the storage for any given game on the drive where it's installed, rather than filling up your internal drive. It's super simple to use. Just press the button, select the two drives you want to sync, and then press submit. Next, the deck will reach out to Steam's API to get a list of game names and their correlated game IDs. After it's done, a window will pop up confirming that you want to sync the data. If the Steam API wasn't able to be reached, then you'll see a lot of question marks, but if not, then you'll see the game names. Either agree or disagree with the movement, and then press submit if you agree. Three notes on this. First, this function will show the amount of space that'll be moved and won't let you move the data if the destination drive is too full to accept the data. Second, if for some reason the correct games don't show up, try entering and exiting game mode. Sometimes the Steam cache stagnates and this fixes it. Third, the data gets stored in the root of any non-internal drive in the folder cryoutilities underscore steam underscore data. If for any reason something goes wrong, this is where you can find the data that was synced to that drive. After all the data is moved, you'll get a confirmation and you're good to go. Last but not least in Cryo Utilities, let's move on to the cleanup game data function. It's very simple to explain. First, press the button. Cryo Utilities will look through all possible directories for shaders and prefixes, then gives you a list asking for which to delete. Reminder that if the API can't be reached, or if the API doesn't have a record of a game for some reason, then it'll just show the game IDs. Select the data that you want to delete, and then press Submit. You might be asking, why would you want to delete them? Well, firstly, Steam leaves some remnants after you uninstall games. They can vary in size, but they never get removed, at least as far as I can tell. The first time I ran this function, I had 150 stale folders taking up more than 900 megabytes of space. Secondly, sometimes there are issues with prefixes caused by game updates, you might break a config file for a game, or for some reason the shader cache could be broken. By using this tool, you can force the deck to re-download and recreate them the next time you launch the game. Before running this, please keep in mind that you NEED to backup game saves for games that don't support cloud saves, BEFORE deleting them here. If you don't, you might lose your save game forever. Alright, and that's the full tutorial on Cryo Utilities 2.0 as well as what each function does. Next, let's go over changing the minimum VRAM. 
Before actually changing the minimum VRAM, I want to briefly explain what VRAM is and how it works with the APU in the Steam Deck. An APU is a CPU or processor and a GPU or graphics processor built into the same chip. That's what many consoles, the Steam Deck, and most phones use. VRAM, or Video Random Access Memory, is memory specifically dedicated to a graphics card. Unfortunately, because the VRAM takes physical space, and because the APU has to remain so small, it has to share memory between the CPU and GPU, meaning that it has no dedicated VRAM, so to speak. This is very bad for performance when both the CPU and GPU need as much memory as they can get. In the Steam Deck, there is 16 gigabytes of total RAM and the GPU can use up to 8 gigabytes of it. The caveat to this is that if the CPU needs any more than 8 gigabytes for any reason, it gets priority and can evict memory from the GPU, even if the CPU only needs that memory for a single cycle. This results in what's called flapping. The CPU evicts memory from the GPU, lets it go shortly after, and then the GPU takes it back. This happens very quickly and repeatedly as memory is needed on both sides, and can cause lots of stutters and lower frame rates in-game. To get around this, we have something called the UMA frame buffer size, which is set to 1 gigabyte by default on the Steam Deck. The UMA frame buffer size is the minimum amount of RAM that will be dedicated to the GPU to use as VRAM. In practice, this means that, by default, the CPU can use up to 15 gigabytes of RAM while the GPU gets starved at 1 gigabyte. Fortunately, Valve lets us set the UMA frame buffer size in BIOS. It can be changed down to 256 megabytes or all the way up to 4 gigabytes, quadrupling the default value. Before we actually enable it, I do want to mention exactly one situation where the 4GB setting is worse for performance. Red Dead Redemption 2 has an engine bug when around water where the frame rate drops, and I've confirmed it to still be an issue. Having a 4GB UMA frame buffer size will cause an even more severe drop. This is the only game that I know to be affected, but I wanted to mention it in case you primarily play Red Dead on the deck. Alright, back to the regularly scheduled programming. First, we have to completely shut the deck down. That can be done through the power menu, the same way you go to desktop mode, then wait until the screen goes completely black. Next, hold both the power button and volume up button until you hear a sound come from the deck, then let it go. Wait a few seconds and you should see a weird looking screen with large buttons. We need to go to the lower right button, setup utility. On this screen, we need to go down one entry to advanced, and then change the UMA frame buffer size from 1G to 4G. Then, press the Steam Deck's Select button and press Yes to save and exit. The Steam Deck will reboot and you should be all done. You can confirm by going to Settings, System, and scrolling down to the VRAM size. As part of this section, I want to quickly address some misinformation I've seen floating around since my last video went live. I've seen a lot of people claim that doing this actually hurts performance, and that is not the whole story. Setting the UMA frame buffer size to a value larger than 1GB can hurt performance in CPU-bound applications by default, but only at stock settings. By using my swap size and swappiness tweaks, the possibility of negative performance is nullified in all situations that I've tested. The reason why there are no negative performance impacts when using the tweaks is simple. By setting the UMA frame buffer size higher without adding swap space or tuning swappiness, you're just stealing memory from the CPU without giving it anywhere else to use. By doing both fixes, the CPU now has a place to put the extra memory, and the tuning to counteract the additional memory pressure. This is the reason that I recommend a minimum of a 4GB swap file. It completely counteracts the CPU performance hit of the UMA tweak. With that out of the way, let's go over some frequently asked questions. Who are you? Hey, I'm Cryobyte33, or Kyle. I'm an American living in Sweden. I have 18 years of Linux experience and work as a DevOps engineer for my day job. I maintain large fleets of Linux servers at work and a lab at home, and I like to help people play the games they love on their decks. As a fun fact about me, the very first game I played was Tekken 3 on the PlayStation 1. Will this harm my Steam Deck? 
I haven't heard of an instance of this happening, but if something unexpected happens, please open an issue on GitHub, message me on Discord, or bring it up in the comments. Does this work on Windows? Unfortunately, no. Windows doesn't allow tuning things this close to the kernel, with the exception of page file size, which is configurable through a GUI in Windows. Do these fixes affect battery life or increase heat generated by the deck? No. This doesn't affect the heat, the fan speed, or battery life, but it could lift a bottleneck and allow the CPU and GPU to work harder. This could raise heat or fan speed or lower battery life by technicality, but it's not a direct result of anything my script does. Rather, just the hardware actually doing its job. If this happens, just lock the frame rate to your preferred setting and everything will perform as expected. Are there any downsides to these fixes? Not that I'm aware of. At worst, performance should break even. Will updates revert these fixes or settings? A firmware update will revert the UMA frame buffer change, which will require you going back into the BIOS to set it again. Aside from that, none of the tweaks should be reset even by updates, but reformatting the deck or reinstalling SteamOS will revert them. I tested with several updates and all tweaks were left in place. In the event that an update somehow does revert some settings, I will do my best to update the community about it and give you steps if necessary. Make sure to follow me over on Mastodon or join the Discord to be alerted to anything I find as it happens. Both have links in the description below. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below, or check out the full FAQ over on GitHub. Alright everyone, with my longest script ever and weeks of development out of the way, don't forget to... Show the like button how much you like it by going on a date, having a scenic wedding, having beautiful like button children, and then growing old together. Open the way to Sen's Fortress of Passion by ringing the bell of awakening. Go to Subway, get your favorite sandwich, and then carve my name in the bread to become a subscribe while simultaneously subscribing to this channel. And comment the words no comment to tell me that you would prefer not to comment. Thank you to my patrons who are helping me save up for a new Steam Deck so I can test overclocking, undervolting, and modding. Verge4469, Mitch, A Zero Fail, Frankie Odgers, Lemon, Brian D, Yi Luo, Pi K, Madam Slug, Spiffman, Bradley C, The Duck, Jean Clich, Jimmy Champagne, Christopher Comer, Keenan Brody, Mario Diaz, Chase Melancon, DevOps D Adams, Larry, Nathan Wilkie, Rafaniac ZX, Aiden, Montana CB7, Shane Duncan, Cam Leavenworth, Kazab FZ, Samuel McConan, Joseph Pizza, Yvonne P, Vic, Quarantined Gambler, Game Dev 50, Nick Breckins, Mioso, Spolt, Anon9001, Justin Rooney, Oscar, The Family Barlev, Stefan R, Philip H, Loep, Optimized Gamer, Great on Deck, ZCC09, Koi Pao, Pixel Gwyn, Daniel M, Antonio Benetti, Luca Tigert, Spring, Rebo93, Evo Lunatic, Sibri, Brandon Greathouse, Anthony Flores, Juan Antonio Fernandez, and Chase Glynn. Thank you to my YouTube members for telling YouTube that I'm really worth it. Eugene Brednev, VV, Prashid Shah, The Wildcat, and Papa Juicy. And lastly, major shout out to Cryptus Primero, Dieter4, and Headbang Tiger for the super thanks. You guys are awesome. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.